During the pandemic, I watched several documentaries about violinists, like Yehudi Menuhin, Nathan Milstein, Yasha Heifetz, all the really good heavyweights, the great players of the 20th century. And I was so moved by this that I said to myself, that's it, as I usually say, if I have crazy ideas, I said, okay, I'm gonna become a violinist. I wanna switch instruments. And so I told this idea to my wife, who's also a pianist, and she was silent, and I said, well, what are you really thinking? <laughs> she said, um, well, you could do it, but it's gonna you know, take you about 10 to 15 years. You'll have to practice 15 hours a day. And I said, you know, I'm from New Jersey originally, I said, forget about it, <laughs> you know, it's not gonna happen. Um, we just had our first kid, so I was like, okay, there's no way. But plan B, which is what I'm still doing, is to learn this repertoire that violinists play on the piano. And there's quite a few you know, very nice arrangements of these pieces, so why not just pretend to be a you know, um, violinist on the instrument that I'm already playing? And it's, a lot of these pieces are originally for piano, even, but you normally hear them on the violin. So I figured that that counts. And what I thought was going to just be maybe a few pieces has turned into just like a big project of pretending to be a violinist. At any rate, I'm going to start with a short piece that's actually is a folk song by a Japanese composer, Narita Tanizo. And I'm thinking of Japan right now, of course, because of the uh, disaster that was there, the earthquake and tsunami. And um, that the sea in Japan, Japanese history and culture, is on the one hand a source of um, beauty, obviously, but also food and transportation, but it's also a threat. It's all these things, and to hammer this home even more, we just, with my family, we just got back from a nice trip to the beach, so I was looking at the water, but if I were to sing this, which I'm not, because you all know about that, um, the text is about nostalgia. It's a man walking along the seashore thinking of his past. It's a beautiful melody very hypnotic, and um, yeah, I'll start with that. What does it have to do with violin is that violinists play this a lot, and the composer, Tanizo, Narita Tanizo, was, um, was a violinist, so it sort of fits with the theme. Here it is, it's a short piece.
Next, I'd like to play a piece called May Breezes by Felix Mendelssohn. It's from the Songs Without Words for piano, but there's a very popular uh, arrangement of this by Fritz Kreisler for violin. And uh, you normally hear it in that version, more than the piano version. So, uh, May Breezes, I suppose, is something we could all uh, have some of now. I mean, it's with this cold weather. But the accompaniment of this piece does definitely evoke those kind of um, slightly humid spring May breezes. Because Mendelssohn is very good at painting something through music. That's how I think of it. I don't know how to explain it more than that, but um, that accompaniment to me is just it's just breezes. It's perfect, you know, depiction of that. So Mendelssohn was a German at that time in Germany. I think he's really from Saxony. Uh, he was born in 1809 and lived a pretty short life, like Schubert and um, Mozart. He died before 40, which is just unimaginable. Um, I had a teacher who described him as follows. He said. Mendelssohn was more Mozartian than Mozart himself, meaning that um, he was such a child prodigy. You know, Mozart, it's not to demean Mozart at all, but Dad, most Leopold Mozart, helped a lot with the early compositions um, from his young years. But with Mendelssohn, it was not the case. It was like he was a fully formed artist at a, at a young age, very young age and very hard working, of course. And what I love, though, about Mendelssohn the most is his, his honesty. It's like he wears his heart on his sleeve. You'll see what I mean in this piece. He's just very um, direct, very honest. I feel he was as, as a person. It shows in his music. Um, yeah, so I'll play this, this piece. It's a typical, typical 19th century uh, romanticism, early romanticism. In the same vein as Schumann, for example, who gave her friend with. So here it is May Breezes by Mendes.
Next, and I guess we're sort of jumping around historically a bit. This is a gavat by Johann Sebastian Bach, and it's arranged for a piano from violin solo uh, by Sergei Rachmaninoff. So I think last time I played the gigantic Chacon by Bach, arranged by Busoni, but this is a much shorter and more maybe lighter, uplifting piece, you know, more in the major key. So um, I guess I can explain some, well, tell some stories about the two composers that are not in the history books. For instance, um, and this really has nothing to do with the piece, but do you know that Bach actually spent a night in the prison, in jail. And he did, he pulled a knife on an oboe player <laughs> during a rehearsal. I'm not making this up. And uh, I think the point is that I want to show that these great composers were obviously geniuses, but they were also people and they had you know, human, uh, it's always this oboe player, no kidding, don't quote me on that. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, Bach was a devoutly religious, you know, he was a church musician. And I came across this theory, it's just a theory, but it's interesting, that the solo suites for the cello, which are dances, you know, Kavat is a dance. It's a French Baroque dance. That even though these are about to put the cello and the violin, these solo suites, um, that although they're secular dances, that he had some biblical scene in mind for each one. It's up to you then what this one is. I was thinking maybe Palm Sunday or something, but I, I'm not really sure. And I don't know if that's true, but it's just an interesting thought. I do hear behind everything Bach wrote, I always hear the Lutheran uh, hymns as a sort of wallpaper behind it. Um, Sergei Rachmaninoff lived closer to our times as he was a Russian composer, lived from 1873 to 1943. And, you know, he was six and a half feet tall, had a shaved head, and he never smiled. And some, I think Stravinsky said he looked like, a, like an escaped convict. Here we are in jail, and I don't know why I'm this on my mind, but, um, and I have a story about him that my grandfather, in the 30s, my grandfather's no longer here, but um, unfortunately, but he met Rahmanov. And so he was the usher at a recital in, in Richmond, Virginia, Rahmanov was performing, and the boss said, don't let anyone through this door. And so 10 minutes later, of course, somebody tried to open the door. And my grandfather pushed back, and this person pushed back, and there was a sort of a fight. And then, wham, the door was kicked open. And it was Rahmanov. <laughs> and he spoke to my grandfather. You know what he said? He said, get out of my way. <laughs> yeah. So I have a personal connection to the history of music. Um, but some people call this arrangement, this Bach arrangement by Rahmanov. Some people refer to it as, as Bachmaninov. And it starts close, as many arrangements, it starts close to the original, and over time, and I'll demonstrate it. The original is, um, you probably know the melody, you know. So that's pretty close to the original. But he adds some things. But by the end, it's Rahmanov, it's Russian bells, you know. Um, so the, his personality maybe maybe takes over towards the end. So here it is, Gavat by Bach, arranged by Rachmaninoff. <laughs>
late 1700s, early uh, 1800s. And this is, of course, the, the arrangements of Franz Liszt. It's a double arrangement, Franz Liszt and Busoni. Busoni lived in the early 20th century and added some tweaks to Liszt's arrangements. Liszt himself did these arrangements several times. He revised them a couple times. But um, Paganini, you know, he was sort of like a force of nature. He was like a rock star of his time, perhaps you could say, and controversial. Say that also. Um, some people, there was a group of people who believed that he was possessed. So I don't think that he actually was, but <laughs> um, and you know his style just it comes from out of the blue. It seems he just like he woke up and it came. You know because you can trace, for example, Bach. You can look at Bostecuta or Schutz or his predecessors, and you can say, well, I'll tell him on that that's. Where Bach comes from, obviously he was a genius, but but Paganini is like, where did this come from? That's why Ivor Giblis, a violinist I adore, I love, is one of the reasons I'm doing this program. One of the you know people this is dedicated to. Giblis said Paganini was like the Big Bang in music, because everything was different after him. And the Romantics loved Paganini. They found in him he was like a lightning bolt of uh, you know, inspiration, and that was the whole ethos really of the Romantic you know, time era. So, um, let's see what else I would say is well, Liszt, you know, lived a bit later. He was born in 1810, and he was not quite the child prodigy that Mendelssohn was. He was sort of. There was a story of Beethoven kissed his hand. There was all this, but um, at any rate. Um, he found himself in Paris, which is not a bad place to be, I guess. But he was in his 20s at the time and sort of stuck. He was doing a lot of teaching and was didn't know what to do next. And he was actually very depressed. He'd fallen in love with a nobleman's daughter or something. It didn't work out. He tried to jump in the Seine River at one point. It was so bad. And the story goes that he heard Paganini perform. And that was it. He locked himself in a room for several years to just practice for hours and hours while reading Shakespeare and Dante and becoming this, you know, he, he hadn't had that kind of education until then. And then he emerged as the list that we remember, Franz List. Um, and the first order of business in that time was to arrange Paganini's violin music for the piano. And I think last time I did the um, Campanella was just massive. So this time I'm going to do, maybe at the end of this time I'll do it again, but I wanted to do two of the 24 caprices for solo violin and arrangement, of course. This first one is called Arpeggio, because it's a bunch of arpeggios. You know, and it's the first of the 24 caprices. When I learned it, I just couldn't get some kind of image. You know, the Mendelssohn, the May breezes, it's just the ocean piece in the beginning. So I always have some sort of image. But with this, I, I just didn't have it. And so I asked my wife, what do you hear? I played the opening for her, which goes. Uh, right so, by the way, that arrangement is almost verbatim to the original violin. The violin room is <laughs> with a bubble like that. But on the piano, it's like fishing with a pen. So it's, just, it's very strange. But anyway, um, my wife said, oh, that's simple. I hear our kitten. We have two cats, two kids, four kids. I tell people. Um, it's our kitten playing with this merry-go-round toy. It's this ball that just goes around and whacks it. That goes around and whacks it all day, all night. Very obnoxious. Any cat lovers here, you know the agony. And um, that's what this piece does. I, and I can't picture any other way. It's just even the, it's like these pawing of my left. So you know I think in all seriousness, I think Paganini, what part of what makes his style special is the sarcastic humor. And knowing that I think he might have approved maybe of that comparison with the kid. So here it is. Thank you. 
is the famous, it's also the famous work of Gorsha, it's the humoresque. It was actually the sixth humoresque he wrote a lot, and uh, for a piano originally, I hadn't known that. Because you hardly, you never hear it on the piano, you hear it on the violin. And this is, I'm playing the piano version with some embellishment by a composer, a pianist, Bidovsky from the 20th century, so it's Dvorak Bidovsky, you could say. But um, humorous means a piece that's obviously humorous, but it's not just uh, that laugh out loud humor. It's, it's humor, but it has, it's more musical humor. And there's a, a undercurrent of melancholy there as well. And I think music can do that, maybe more than language. So here it is, it has that Dvorak feeling that was in the last one, a uh, certain warmth to it. So here it is. Very short work 
The next few things are very folk influence. This is the um, Malagueño from the España Suite by Albanese. I think I'd say there's a more famous Malagueño, a Cuban composer like Colonna, maybe next time. But this one is lived by Albanese. And Malagueño means a woman from Malaga. Malaga is a city in the south of Spain. And it is the or a capital of flamenco music. So Albanese was actually, funny thing enough, was that he was Catalan near Barcelona, but um, lived in Paris, I think, most of his life. And he was a brilliant composer and pianist from the get-go, but he hadn't really found his voice until he started to emulate Spanish flamenco music, which is the music of really the south of Spain. And um, this is it's a little bit like Dvorak with the Gypsy songs and many, many others at this time, late 19th century, early 20th century. Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, that opening bassoon solo is straight out of the book of the Ukrainian folk melodies. He stole, I mean, borrowed it from, the, from that. So this, somebody told me, I've never heard this on the piano, uh, I was hearing on the guitar. And funny enough, Albanese never wrote a, a single guitar piece. But the, what you hear on the guitar by Albanese is piano pieces that have to for it. So Flamenco, music reflects the melting pot that Spanish history is and was. And that the in the Middle Ages it was Moorish and so it was Arabic. And the food, the architecture here in Seville or Cordoba is, is Arabic architecture. And the music too, I mean this melismatic melody is like in the middle of this piece it sounds like the, you know Arabic music you could say.
This one's called Romanian Garden Gate. It's very lively. And then it, it segues into this last one called Little One. It's unbridled joy to it. So here are the six Romanian folk dances by Bartok. And he wrote it for piano first, but then he himself touched it up for violin. There's a recording, I don't know, old recordings, fanatic, Bartok himself at the piano, and Joseph Shigeti, not spaghetti, but Shigeti, playing the, playing the violin. Unbelievable. Best things in the world, these things. So. <laughs>